Subscribe to Mother's Basement. Yeah, I don't think anyone will argue that Blend S is at least the memeiest OP of 2017, but is it one of the best? You'll find out in a second, but first I need to do a bit of housekeeping and correct a few errors from part one of this list, which, by the way, you can watch by clicking the little eye icon up there. First correction, the name of the Adam the Beginning OP isn't After the Rain, that's the band, apparently. The song is called Kaido Kufuno, or Indecipherable. Also, I goofed a bit while talking about Sakura Quest. Ayaka Nanase is the name of the actor who plays the protagonist. The actual character's name is Yoshino Kohara. Hope no one noticed I screwed that one up. <laughs> anyway, without further ado, let's break down the actual, definitive, objectively correct top five anime openings of 2017, starting, of course, with fifth place, where we're looking at the fun side of character song OPs. Ones that feature characters bantering, bouncing off each other, or generally cracking wise. Obviously, these tend to be the domain of comedies, be they moe series like Urara Merocho or New Game with two exclamation points now, or slightly more sarcastic moe series like Umaru Chan R, Gabriel Dropout, and Love Tyrant. Blend S definitely stands out among all the moe comedies this year for its infectious theme song and bouncy, energetic animation, not to mention all of of the memes, and obviously I've got a special affection for gamers, which has its main girls sing about gaming as a metaphor for their love lives, layered over top of some remarkably faithful and beautifully animated video game references, but surprisingly, the winner of this category isn't about cute girls at all. Crazy. If you're not familiar, Hozuki no Reitetsu is a comedy anime that portrays running hell and punishing sinners as a 9 to 5 job. It stars Hozuki, a stuffy, smart, and sadistic demon bureaucrat who works under King Enma, but is really basically his boss, to make sure everything in Jigoku, that's Japanese hell, runs smoothly. It's a pretty damn funny show with a lot to recommend it, but it really stands out for its OPs. The first one was essentially a national anthem for Jigoku, where all of the show's characters got together to sing about how proud they were of their demonic home. Its animated wall scroll, or kakemono aesthetic, would have been an easy pick for my 2014 list if I'd been running this channel back then, and I've been looking for an opportunity to talk about it for a long time now. Fortunately, Dean has managed to keep that OP quality high after inheriting the series from Wit Studio. The new theme, Dai Jigo Jigo Bushi, plays more as a tourism commercial jingle than an anthem, bringing the whole cast back to sing about how scenic and fun hell is, with an exasperated King Enma repeatedly chiming in to clarify that no, it's really not. As you'd expect, what makes this OP shine is the way the characters bounce off each other, an effect that's only amplified by the sheer number of them. The cast of this show is absolutely massive, but you get a real sense for everyone's personalities from the brief, sometimes just a second long snippets that you see of them. The little details, like how Shiro gets distracted and starts chasing his tail when he's supposed to be singing the chorus, really help to bring the whole production to life and give each character a distinctive identity. The most impressive part of this OP by far is definitely the 3D camera rotations that CGI assisted though they may be are remarkably well animated. The slapstick sequence that leads to King Enma being knocked into a cauldron of molten magma and then thrown into a snowbank is particularly particularly slick and pretty damn funny to boot. All of this creates a palpable sense of chaos that gives you a bit of an idea of what a headache it must be for Hozuki to manage this whole cast. But it also builds this fun, festive atmosphere that you really want to be part of. It's an ideal advertisement both for Hell and for this quirky, underappreciated comedy. Between this, Sakura Quest, and our next winner, you could probably say that's a running theme with many of my picks, but I promise you that it just happened to work out that way. In fourth place, we're looking at OPs that are carried by stylistic gimmicks, unique or remarkable animation styles that make them stand out from the rest of the pack. In general, it feels like a lot of anime have been more ambitious or experimental with their openings this year, but it's still worth highlighting the ones that go really out there. OPs like Laughing Salesman, with its trippy, morphing motion graphics and CGI, or Rage of Bahamut Virgin Soul, which uses a similarly limited color palette to 
enhance the intensity of its action scenes. Or Garo, Vanishing Line, which only uses color to accent a sketchy black and white CGI style that's even more reminiscent of the classic Wii beat em up Mad World than your average Mad World OP. And then, of course, there's Kake Garui, which opens each episode with a psychosexual feast for the eyes, as well as the mouth, there's a lot of food here, that many had pegged for OP of the year when it first started airing. And while it doesn't quite make the cut for this list, I still gave it the what's in an OP treatment back in the summer, so if you're curious to hear what I think about it, go watch that. This category is far from just being about crazy color palettes, though. I also have to give props to Hina Logi for its charming and vibrant paint paper stop-motion intro sequence, and to our ultimate winner, which pretty much does the opposite by bringing real-world photos into its animated reality. Narugamama Sawagumama from the Eccentric Family 2. The idea of drawing animated characters into real photos of Kyoto is a perfect fit for the story of this series, a tale about Tanuki and Tengu who live secretly alongside humans in modern-day Kyoto. And as clever as it is in concept, it's even better in execution. The compositing in this OP is absolutely phenomenal. None of the shots are flat. The photographs have all been separated into layers to give them real three-dimensional depth, particularly when the camera pans across them. And the characters have a real physicality to them as they move through these spaces. The lighting on every one of them is nearly flawless, and the effect when it's all put together is pretty damn incredible. Of course, I'm a sucker for creative title placement, and no other OP this year has done that better. Credits are placed on signs in the backgrounds and placed in the environments as three-dimensional objects that look like they're really there. With surreal animated effects dancing across these layers and careful attention paid to where things lie in 3D space, right down to their shadows, every background feels full of life despite the fact that they're almost all static images. It creates the distinct impression of a world frozen in time, where a lot of other shows that try for a similar effect just end up looking like, well, cartoons drawn on top of photos. Now, if you caught that qualifier a second ago, I say almost because one of the backgrounds in this OP was actually filmed using a 360 degree camera moving down an alleyway. The shot was then shrunk down into a sphere at the center of the screen, and the sky was keyed out, leaving only the buildings and the street below, creating the impression of a mini planetoid encapsulating all of Kyoto. And then they animated a person running through it just to show off. Off. I say just to show off because the whole time this is on screen, there are crazy effects going on in the background and characters flying directly into the camera that distract from just how impressive what's going on at the center of the frame actually is. I've run out of time talking about this OP without even touching on the theme by Milk Tub, which is fantastic, or the actual animation, editing, and shot composition, also fantastic, because this effect is just so impressive and well-realized that I can't help being awed by it. You can rest assured that there's plenty of meaning in the character interactions and framing, but ultimately it's the sheer spectacle and imagination of this OP that puts it this high on the list. If you're looking for something with a bit more depth to it, in an emotional sense rather than a dimensional one, then you'll be happy with our third place entry where we're looking at dramatic OPs. That is, openings with emotionally evocative direction. These often precede fantasy or sci-fi series that either have less of an action focus, like Kato the Right Answer, Kino's Journey, and Children of the Whales, or ones that just want to stand out from the crowd, like Grand Blue Fantasy. But naturally, these OPs are most at home in front of romantic shows, from serious, sordid affairs like Kuzu no Hankai, Fuka, and Love and Lies, to lighter-hearted stuff like Our Love Has Always Been 10 Centimeters Apart, or Recovery of an MMO Junkie, which I can't actually show you because its music producers are phenomenal assholes when it comes to YouTube copyright. Suck a dick, Victor Entertainment. Suck a dick. By the way, the What's in an OP for that will be back up January 2nd, if you're curious. Just because a stellar drama series from Gamers Studio Pine Jam very nearly took this spot with its beautiful, impressively cinematic feeling opening and strong visual metaphors, but if you've been paying any attention to this channel over the last two years, then you probably already know what beat it. Showa Genroku Rakugo Shinju didn't 
quite make the list last year due to its OP being a little on the simple side, although the music was great, but it really brought it this year with its second opening, Imawa no Shinigami, which, man, holy shit. It doesn't get much more dramatic or emotional than watching an old man, Yakumo Yorakute, turn away from all of his friends and loved ones and descend into his own personal hell. All while the ominous clock that the theme song uses for percussion slowly ticks down to his inevitable demise. In describing it, I suppose that the narrative of this OP is pretty simple as well, but the way that it's executed is masterful. Haunting imagery paired with an equally haunting theme song retelling a person's final conversation with the Grim Reaper. An ethereal pathway of stars turns into a steep cliff which Yakumo dives off of only to find a Rakugo stage under the waves at its base, which is above him somehow. Turning away from the grasping hand of his apprentice Yotaro, he sinks beneath the water, or I guess above it, and the reflection of the moon transforms into a vinyl record emblazoned with images of the women in his life, which we then see all of his friends and family standing on top of in a circle around him. This is nightmare logic at its finest, both captivating and utterly chilling to behold. It speaks to Yakumo's guilt and sadness, to the desperation of his loved ones to help him, and to the encroaching inevitability of his own death. The OP does offer up glimmers of hope, only for them to be snuffed out one by one, leaving Yakumo alone with the specter of regret hanging off his back in the form of his old friend Suki Roku, his fine clothes revealed to just be a shell around his cold, dead interior. His memories flash by in reverse, making it seem as though Konatsu and Yotaro are now turning away from him, and after a final peaceful moment, the light of his life is blown out in an instant. This OP is pointed and gorgeous and brilliant, much like the show that it precedes. And there's not much else that I can say that you won't feel just by watching it. Again, just like the series. We move back out of the realm of niche appeal anime with our second place slot, where we're looking at action OPs. OPs that involve action. I, I really hope I don't have to explain that further. This is another category where we were absolutely spoiled for choice this year. From more obscure series like Infinity Force and Robo Masters, to game adaptations like Katsugeki Token Ranbu and Tales of Zestiria the X, and of course plenty of mainstream shonen series, there were many strong contenders this year. This could have easily gone to Kekai Sensen and Beyond, or My Hero Academia, or to Boruto which made so many bold choices with its first and second OPs that I was half tempted to lump it in with more stylized openings in fourth place. And of course, the fourth OP for Twin Star Exorcists was once again an incredibly strong contender, very nearly winning the series a place on the list for the second year running, but I mean, who are we kidding here? Attack on Titan was always going to win. The series has always had incredibly hype openings, and the third one, Shinzo o Sosageo by, once again, Link Horizon, might well be the best yet. They certainly spared no expense making it compared to the last two. I don't think that it's physically possible to watch this or listen to it without getting your heart pumping. From Seraph of the Edge to Kabaneji of the Edgy Fortress, and especially Attack on Titan, Wit Studio has proven themselves time and again to be masters of the interest curve. I talked about this concept in depth in my first Haikyuu video, but in brief, an interest curve is the modulation of engagement or excitement in a piece of media over time. Instead of building up constantly the best stories, scenes, fights, songs, video game levels, everything really, they all ebb and flow in intensity, building up and then dropping down a bit so that the audience isn't too exhausted to enjoy the next big spike in action. Sasageo is as close as you can get to a perfect example of this. It starts with a hugely thrilling moment as a promise of what's to come. Like every OP in the series, we start looking at a stone relief of a woman, but this time the music explodes as we pull back to reveal that the statue is lying in the blood-soaked rubble of a city devastated by the Titans. 
Then the intensity dips back down as we see humans preparing to fight and titans roaming the land, gradually building up to the level of that first high and well beyond it with flashes of violent imagery and impending threats. By the time the soldiers dive off the wall to attack the titan hordes, we're past the height of that initial spike, and after one final moment of calm, the action flares up all at once. And that action sequence, oh boy. With this OP, Wit has finally managed to top the insane roof-running segment of Gurren no Yumiya, showing a full battle against the Colossal Titan that features a new pinnacle of maneuverable gear acrobatics from Mikasa and environmental destruction on a massive scale, building up to Eren transforming into his Titan form and finally going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Armored Titan. But then we freeze frame and cut to an even more exciting montage of natural violence before seeing a new threat rampaging across the land. The Beast Titan, with a horde of other massive beasts laying waste to everything in their wake, and bringing us full circle to the ruined city from the start of the OP, now covered with dust, allowing us to calm down a bit before the show proper begins, but leaving us beyond hyped for what's coming next. Like previous Attack on Titan OPs, there are plenty of references, hidden details, and bits of foreshadowing that I can speak to here, and I probably will at a later date, but it's excellence in craft that puts this OP above the rest. This is a near-perfect example of a highly engaging structure paired with some of the most fluid and kinetic cinematography and editing in anime, courtesy of the king of anime bombast himself, Tetsuro Araki, who storyboarded the opening and did some of the key animation for it. Every time I watch this opening and the action picks up, I can't help pumping my fists along with it, and I can't really think of a stronger endorsement for it than that. It's just great. Great action, great music, great imagery, it's everything a shonen OP should be. And it would be the best OP of the year if not for... Actually, before we get to that, I think that we should take a moment to shamelessly build up your anticipation for my top pick, if you haven't guessed it already, I mean. And since I kinda already did the honorable mentions thing for 70 some odd anime openings while talking about the other ones, I'm going to briefly shake things up by naming the worst OP of the year, if for nothing else than to give you guys a point of contrast so that you can see just how good the OPs on this list really are. There was some pretty strange strong competition for this award as well, like Knights and Magic, which managed to ruin Fauna by being excruciatingly boring, or Classroom of the Elite, which tries to make up for a total lack of interesting visual depth by crowding the screen with random pretentious literary quotes, or King's Game the Animation, which decided to preempt its fans by making its own hilariously edgy AMV. And then there's Vatican Kiseki Chosakan, which features several vacation snapshots from one of the animator's trips to the Vatican, as well as some of the most bafflingly inept CGI in the history of all film ever, not just anime. But in terms of bad CGI and bad openings, nothing this year could really top one of the earliest contenders, Handshakers. With its high frame rate CGI mixed with low frame rate 2D animation, Handshakers comes across more as an experiment in inducing motion sickness than an actual show that someone would watch for entertainment purposes. Nonetheless, it has an OP, and if you can believe it, it's even worse than the show itself. The action scenes are incomprehensible and vomit inducing, the motion only matches the music sometimes and then accidentally, and the character shots are literally just random assortments of clips from the show thrown together in a messy jumble with no sense of composition whatsoever. And then there's the effects, random particles and other bullshit that flood the screen almost constantly, to the point that you probably can't even accurately see just how bad it is because the constant tiny motion actually fucks with YouTube's video compression algorithm. But even when you can see what's going on, this OP is almost impossible to follow and just unpleasant to watch. I actually got a headache from trying to write this bit while looking at it. And the cherry on top, the jizz icing on this dog turd cake, is the credit font, which has to be the ugliest goddamn font I've ever seen in my entire life. Every single credit in this OP actually looks like it's been stretched to the wrong aspect ratio. It's absurd. 
Gohans literally couldn't manage to do a single thing right in throwing this together. It's almost impressive, but let's move on to talking about something that's actually impressive. Without further ado, our number one pick, the best OP of 2017 is... Recreators, specifically the second opening of Recreators, Shout by Hiroyuki Sawano. Although the first OP, Gravity Wall, also by Sawano, is also pretty fantastic. I don't think anyone will be particularly surprised by this pick, especially not if they've been paying attention to what I've mentioned and not mentioned up to this point. I've gone to bat for Recreators repeatedly. It's my absolute favorite show of the year, and I was actually a bit hesitant to give it the top slot because of that. I'm still worried that I'm I'm going to be accused of bias for this pick, but I'd be doing you guys a disservice if I let the best OP of the year take a hit just because I was worried what some people might think. So what makes this OP so damn special? Well, for starters, Hiroyuki Sawano. When it comes to creating adrenaline-pumping theme and insert songs, there's pretty much no one better, and in my opinion, this is one of his best songs yet. And as the Sawano drop meme has demonstrated, you can set basically anything to this guy's music and make it ten times cooler. But I don't judge openings on music, I judge them on everything else, and that's where Recreators really shines. This is another OP that has that whole interest curve thing down pat, building up slowly to an explosion of action that, while it's not quite as impressively animated as Attack on Titan, is just as exciting for how it's paced out, edited together, and synced up with the music. And while we don't actually see anyone hit anyone else, that's not a cost-saving measure, there's a narrative reason behind it. This is another one of those OPs that gets me pumping my fists every time I watch it. On top of that, the shot composition is beautiful, but more than that, each shot is laden with meaning. In particular, the character shots that build up into the action climax are remarkably dense, reflecting the emotional state of each creation in the lead up to the final battle with Altair. Look at this shot of Alisteria. As the darkest, most solid part of the picture, her legs and weapon in the top right corner are naturally the first thing that jumps out to you. And if you look at just those, it seems as though she's standing stoically, holding her weapon at the ready to jump into battle. But when you look down at her reflection beneath the surface, you see that she's actually mourning the loss of Mamika, represented by her ribbon. That loss is going to drive everything she does from here on out. Then there's this shot of Rui using his super advanced mech as a seat for his leisurely convenience store picnic, while the world and people that he's supposed to protect are a distant blur in the background, reflecting how, as Recreator's off-brand version of Shinji, Rui enjoys his newfound freedom from the responsibilities placed on him in his old world. The following shot of Magane leisurely munching on a churro and tapping her foot as she looks out at the presently empty stage for the final battle ominously shows that she knows exactly what the heroes are planning and she is waiting eagerly for the fun to start. I could go on and on talking about this OP and this show for that matter because it just gives me so much to talk and think about. Every one of these character shots is just as detailed as the ones I just went over. Notice how nobody is actually looking at the camera. This is in incredibly efficient and potent visual storytelling. And while the shots introducing new creations toward the end of the OP are more conventional and less meaningful overall, they're still a ton of fun. It's adorable how embarrassed Hikayu is that everyone is looking at her first kiss. I don't want to run this much longer, but I can't wrap this up without talking about the recurring imagery that carries over from the first OP. The dry, cracked wasteland that we see first Sota and then Altair standing in at the middle and end point of each opening. I've been asked more than a few times what this is exactly, and it's actually a dried out seabed, an allusion to the writings of Friedrich Nietzsche, who used the metaphor of an open sea, which represents both endless possibilities and the terrifying unknown to convey the creative potential that he saw as the benefit of relinquishing one's belief in God and any meaning inherent in the universe. The dry seabed, then, represents the end of these creative possibilities that results from the end of Setsuna's life, the inciting incident for the whole series, and 
Okay, I'm really running over time now. I'm working on an extensive video about the philosophy of recreators, which also touches on both openings, so I'll dive deeper into this empty sea when that comes out. For now, I just hope that I've managed to convey even a fraction of the meaning that's hidden in this OP, and justify why I think it deserves this top spot. It's a rare OP indeed that manages to be this information dense and this fun to watch at the same time. And that's a testament to the immense skill of both A. Aoki as a director and Sabano as a composer. Shout from Recreators is, without a doubt, the best anime opening of 2017. Well guys, that's the list. I hope you enjoyed watching it because it took a lot of work to put it all together. I try to be as thorough as possible when I make these things, which means watching literally hundreds of anime openings over and over again, and I have to do that while simultaneously creating enough content to actually put food on my table week to week. But even after all of that effort, I'm still 100% sure that some of you are gonna feel like I overlooked something or did a great OP a disservice, and I actually love reading discussions like that, so let me know in the comments below what your favorite OPs of the year are and whether you agreed or disagreed with my picks. And I would really appreciate it if you would share this video with your friends and talk about your favorite openings with them while you do it because that would really, really help out the channel. By the way, while you're down there, if you enjoyed watching this, consider leaving a like and subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And if you really love what I do, consider supporting me on Patreon like all of these beautiful human beings. Now, you might have noticed that there are more beautiful human beings on this list than there normally are, and that's because, this being the end of the year, I want to do something special for all of the patrons who've supported me over the year and uh, put all of their names on the list instead of just the top patrons who pay to have their names in the credits of every video. Uh, thank you so much to everybody who has, you know, backed me up over the last year and... and helped me pay my bills and, and helped me pay for editors. I had to get two to work on this video uh, because, it, I mean, Christmas is a very tight time for everybody and I, I just really wanted to get this out before the end of the year. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for all of your help. Thank you for a great year. It has been um, a wild ride and I am so glad that you were all here to take this journey with me. And I am looking forward to see where we're going next in 2018. Thank you. All right, now back to your regularly scheduled end card. If you want to watch my previous OP top lists, I have a whole playlist of those right here. Or if you're in the mood for something a little different, click here for a short video essay about how we can keep old anime relevant in the age of simulcasts. And if this is the last you see of me today, then I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.